Okay, I think we're going to get started. I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you so much for coming to this meeting tonight. Um, my name is Marilee Smith and I'm a patient advocate at the Adult Down Syndrome Center and I'd like to introduce some of my colleagues. Grace O'Connor is a patient advocate. Shana Fromlet, Fromlet, sorry, Fromlet, I always say that wrong, is our clinical social worker. And Trisha McDonough is in the back. She's our clinical coordinator. And as a team, we all recognize that there was a need to provide more information, help, and support to our families with um, individuals with Alzheimer's and Down syndrome, and also to help staff people, too, that are caring for folks. Um, we weren't quite sure exactly how to go about that, and we were thinking, you know, while we were in the process of thinking of it and coming up with a plan, we were approached by um, some parents, um, Bill and Kara Zermulin, and they came to us. You can stand. I'm so glad you're here. Um, they came to us really asking for some support. So from that call, we had a meeting together, and we just came up with a plan and thought we need to start somewhere. So having an informational meeting might be the best place to start. But we really see this as a beginning tonight, um, recognizing that people know, need ongoing support. We have given you all a survey at your chairs. And if you would take time sometime this evening to fill that out, we would really appreciate your input and to know how, how there might be other ways that we can serve you, whether you would like more meetings like this, whether the families would like to gather, get together and form a support group, or if you have some new ideas for us, if you fill that out and let us know. We'll take it from there and we'll stay in touch with you and let you know what develops. Um, we have a nice combination tonight of family members and staff people, and you all have something in common, that you have someone you love and care for with Down syndrome and possibly Alzheimer's now, too. Um, so we're glad to have this combination of staff and families, and we're really happy to have you here. Um, we have two speakers tonight, and we will allow some time at the end when both speakers have finished for some questions and comments, because I'm sure you will have some. So our first speaker is Dr. Shacoin, who I don't think really needs an introduction here. You probably all know him as our medical director and the person that was here when the clinic opened its doors 22 years ago. And in that time, Dr. Shacoin has very caringly, lovingly taken care of many, many patients with Down syndrome and also some with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. So he will speak to us tonight about the medical aspects of Alzheimer's and um, so we're happy to have him here. Our second speaker is Dan Kuhn. He is from Rainbow Hospice. And Dan is a community educator, a clinical social worker. And since 1987, he has focused on dementia care and of life issues and family caregiving. He's authored more than 50 publications. And he has unique experience in working with families um, with patient, and caregivers for patients with intellectual disabilities. So we are very fortunate to have him here with us tonight, and Dan will be speaking second. There are a few handouts in the back or um, resource material that you're welcome to take. Um, there's a bathroom right around the corner. Uh, there should be some water out. Um, and I think that's it. So turn it over to Dr. Chapin. So welcome. Can everybody hear me okay? I, I'm told sometimes I speak softly, although I'm sure my children would question that. But uh, um, great to be here tonight. This is really a, a long a dream of mine that we would start to have some uh, uh, educational opportunities here in the clinic. Uh, as was mentioned, we opened 22 years ago, and and, and two years ago we moved into this this uh, uh, building here, and, the, and this space really does allow us to do things like this. And certainly starting with Alzheimer's disease, which is so challenging for so for quite a few of our patients, uh, I think is a, a, a wonderful way to start to kick off a, a, what I hope is an ongoing uh, a presentation series. Uh, uh, this is also tonight, if, if all is working well, and, and as of an hour ago it wasn't, so <laughs> I make no promises, this is also uh, being live on the Internet. And if all is going equally as well, this is also being recorded so that we can post it on the Internet later. So. Um, Time will tell. But so it's new, tech, new technology to us, and we're just still learning. So um, if any time you can't hear me, please just uh, wave or anything, and, and I will uh, make sure we're uh, talking loud or more loudly. 
So first of all, just for those of you who don't know, this, the clinic, uh, again, opened in 1992, and uh, it started when the, national, the families of the National Association for Down Syndrome came to the hospital and asked them to start a clinic for adults with Down Syndrome. There were at the time two pediatric clinics in the city, in the Chicago metropolitan area, but no uh, clinics for adults. Uh, and and uh, so we, the hospital agreed to start it, and, and uh, through a series of events, it ended up on the chairman of family medicine's desk, and uh, he asked me if I would start the clinic, uh, and, and uh, we did uh, 22 plus years ago. So what's now Advocate Medical Group and Advocate Lutheran General Hospital took on the challenge. Um, we started two mornings a month, and, and now it's a very full-time. We have two full-time physicians, a full-time nurse practitioner, and, and, a, and a number of other staff, some of whom you've met this evening. And we've seen over 5,500 adults and adolescents with Down syndrome, which to my understanding is the, the largest sample of anybody in the world. Um, it's also the only, my understanding, it's the only clinic for people with Down syndrome that uh, does primary care in the United States. So it's, uh, we have some unique aspects here. So we've had the opportunity to learn from a whole lot of people and part of this is what we think is our responsibility now to give back and share with what some of what you have taught us. And that's what this evening is about. So first off, we're going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. We ought to talk about life expectancy. Uh, life expectancy now is about 60. Uh, in 1900, it was uh, 9. So if the rest of us had increased by the same percentage between 1900 and now, we'd all be living to be about 350. So it's a, it's a significant change in a, in a relatively short time. We actually had the uh, privilege of uh, uh, evaluating one of the oldest well-documented people with Down syndrome. She died at age 83. Uh, and she actually died of the complications of a fractured hip, a lot of which had to do with being 83 in a woman, although osteoporosis is more common in people with Down syndrome. Um, for those, I obviously didn't know her all, all of her 83 years, but uh, for those of who, who had known her for many, many years, this is certainly a paramount to what we're talking about tonight, they reported she had no evidence of cognitive decline. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. There are, however, some premature aging issues. So people with Down syndrome do have some uh, issues with the age more rapidly. So we begin, oftentimes, if you look at folks with Down syndrome, up to about age 35, they often look younger than their chronological age. And then as you begin to get beyond 35 and 40, they often seem to age more rapidly. So we begin to think of people in their uh, late 30s and 40s and 50s as perhaps 5, 10, 15, even 20 years older than their chronological age. And some of the health issues also come 5, 10, 15, 20 years earlier. And that's some of what we're going to talk about tonight as well. I should mention, and we're not going to talk about this tonight because we have a fairly short period of time and we're focusing on Alzheimer's, but there are a number of health issues that are less common in people with Down syndrome. So we were just, I was just talking with Dan about uh, some of his experience with Rainbow Hospice with some of our patients. And so uh, the, the majority of the folks that we've referred to, to Rainbow have had Alzheimer's disease because we see very few people with uh, cancer, almost nobody with heart attacks. And so there are some conditions actually that are much less common uh, in people with Down syndrome. So certainly what is Alzheimer's disease, and, and a lot of you could certainly answer this uh, in a lot of ways, but certainly from a very personal way, uh, unfortunately, but uh, it's certainly it's a progressive neurological condition. It affects the brain and it is a type of dementia. Now, people often ask me, is this dementia or is this Alzheimer's disease? Well, it's both. Dementia is sort of a, a broad category, sort of like genetic diseases, and Down syndrome is one of the genetic diseases. Dementia is the big category, and Alzheimer's disease is one of the one of the types, and there are, there are multiple types of, of uh, dementia. In Alzheimer's disease, microscopically, if you look at the brain, you will see what are called uh, plaques and tangles. Those are changes that are seen in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, typically, we don't do a brain biopsy to make the diagnosis. Typically, if that's seen, it's going to be seen after the person has passed away. Uh, but that, that is what has been found, and also in research, people have looked at this extensively. So what is the association between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease? Uh, I uh, was looking a while back, as getting ready for this, and I found a, a wonderful chapter in this book that gives a great summation of, of a lot of studies. And so they looked at the, the, the uh, took a number of studies together and, and looked at what was the, what was the find, what were the findings. What they what the st accumulation of these studies have found is that nearly all people with Down syndrome over age 40 have plaques and tangles. So. Nearly all people with Down syndrome over the age of 40 have the same changes in the brain that are seen in people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, that doesn't mean everyone has clinical Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Also in these studies, they found that 
virtually everybody over the age of 60 with Down syndrome had these plaques and tangles. Again, that doesn't mean everybody over the age of 60 develops Alzheimer's disease, and we're going to talk about that. To me, actually, I, found that, I find that one of the real interesting research questions. A lot of times people are looking at, okay, people with Down syndrome have these plaques and tangles. How do we study that? To me, one of the interesting things is we ought to be studying how come all those people that with Down syndrome that have those plaques and tangles that don't have Alzheimer's disease? Whatever they have, I want some of it because I you know, have a family history of Alzheimer's. So, um, so what do we do or what do you do if, if you suspect Alzheimer's disease? If this person is having some change and, and what, what, what are we going to do? So what we do is we look for a pattern of decline and then we rule out other potential causes. So. In some ways, Alzheimer's disease is a, is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you've got to look for other things that can also cause dementia that are potentially reversible. And unfortunately, as of uh, May of 2014, Alzheimer's disease is not reversible. But there are a lot of reasons for dementia that are potentially reversible, and we're going to talk about some of them in just a second. So what are the key diagnostic issues in people with Down syndrome? And these are not unique to folks with Down syndrome, but there are some differences. I like to say that, you know, unfortunately, if you start with an IQ of 150 or 50, unfortunately, in many ways, Down syndrome, I'm, all, I'm sorry, in many ways, Alzheimer's disease is the great equalizer because in the end, it looks an awful lot alike for all, everybody. But there are some issues that are, a little, that, that are different in folks with Down syndrome. We're going to talk about those. So first thing is memory deterioration is, is, a, is a big issue. Oftentimes, it's just as in the general population, we'll start with short-term memory. I can't remember what I had for lunch. But I can, I can remember what Aunt Sally said at dinner 30 years ago. And that's, we see that commonly. Unfortunately, eventually, the long-term memory goes as well. And, that, and so both, both uh, deteriorate. Loss of previously mastered skills. So one of the challenges in, in the neurological testing, the, the psychological testing that uh, most of the rest of us would be given if, if we have a decline in skills to see if we have Alzheimer's, uh, although there are some now that are specific for people with Down syndrome, um, a lot of those tests will say, well, the person can't do X, Y, or Z, therefore they must have Alzheimer's disease. But if you go back and look, this person with Down syndrome could never do X, Y, or Z. So it really, you have to modify the test to, to, to see what the person uh, previously mastered skills. So if they've lost previously mastered skills, that's different than not having the skill you know, at all. <coughs> Another thing is incontinence is common in our patients with Down syndrome to develop Alzheimer's disease. And it can come later. But it's actually something that we also see can actually come earlier, which is a little different in people with uh, than in the general population. What's called gait apraxia, which is where the gait becomes unsteady and people have difficulty walking. And oftentimes in folks with Down syndrome, it's it's leaning. And oftentimes we actually see that they lean when they're sitting as well, not just when they're not just when they're standing or walking. Unfortunately, some of our patients, it's often most common, it's leaning to to the side. And I don't know why, but it seems to be the left much more than the right. I know I can't explain that, but it seems to just having listened to the people, that seems to be the case. Unfortunately, also sometimes it's leaning forward, and it gets worse as people walk. So they're walking, and they lean more and more forward and more and more, and at some point, that's just not compatible with, without fall, you know, they're going to fall. And so falling becomes a real, a real problem with, with this. The other interesting thing that I've seen over and over and over is many of our patients, as they begin to become unsteady, lose a lot more of their ability to walk long before they've actually lost the ability to walk. And I think fear plays a huge role in this. They begin to feel unsteady, and so they become afraid to walk much more than they actually are not able to walk. But it does, it's certainly, from a standpoint of not walking, it's still the same. They're still not walking. Uh, and then swallowing problems are, are common. I, I like, to, like to think that people with uh, Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's disease. The areas that people with Down syndrome tend to have problems anyway tend to be the areas that become a problem earlier in Alzheimer's disease. So what does that mean? How does that translate? So people, a lot of people with Down syndrome have trouble swallowing in some way their whole life. You know, they're, they, they have choking or they have, they have difficulty uh, uh, with chewing. They have a, lot of, a lot of issues with swallowing in our patients. When people with their brain begins to deteriorate, swallowing can become a, a significant problem. And it can become a significant problem fairly early on in, in the course of of the, of the disease, which again is, is different than what you would see in, the, in people without Down syndrome. Unfortunately, the terminal event, if you will, the, what usually takes people with Alzheimer's disease most commonly is a re related to the issue of swallowing because they begin to develop recurrent aspiration pneumonia, and that becomes a real problem. And even if they're not eating, 
they can still aspirate their own secretions. So people can get pneumonia even if, even if they're not eating at all. So um, are we really going to go into too much detail with G-tubes, but the feeding tubes that uh, people have talked about putting into people to prevent swallowing problems, to prevent pneumonia, unfortunately don't work because they still aspirate their own secretions even if they're not eating. The thing that's probably the biggest difference in folks with Down syndrome with Alzheimer's disease from folks without Down syndrome with Alzheimer's disease is seizures. In a little study we did, about 70% of our, 77% of our patients with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease had seizures. And in, in the literature, it talks about 2% about in the general population. And the other interesting thing is occasionally, sometimes, this is actually the first clear symptom that the person is developing Alzheimer's disease. And so they have, we don't see any memory loss, we're not seeing anything else, and they develop a seizure. Now, not everybody in the older, not every older person with Down syndrome develops a seizure develops Alzheimer's disease, but many of them will. And so if, if one of our patients develops seizures later in life, we keep an eye on them to watch to see if there's any evidence of further decline uh, to suggest, or decline to suggest Alzheimer's disease. And then weight loss is, is, a, is a common uh, symptom. Uh, some of it may have to do with uh, uh, beginning to lose the social cues. We eat for a lot of reasons, some of them because it's 8 o'clock and noon and 6 o'clock, some of it because, you know, my neighbor's eating, so I'm going to eat, and people begin to lose those social cues. Some of it actually is a loss of appetite. Uh, some of it's swallowing problems. So there's a lot of reasons people will eventually have weight loss uh, with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And then what some people have written in folks with Down syndrome is always the first symptom, and I don't agree with this, but it, it is always the first symptom, are personality or psychological changes. We certainly have seen them, and they're frequent, and kind of, we're going to talk about some of them in just a second. They're common in people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, um, but we don't always necessarily see it as the first change. In fact, sometimes we've seen seizures as the first change and, and memory and other issues. So uh, it's common, but it's not necessarily the first, uh, uh, first symptoms in our experience. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so the question is, again, we have someone that's declining. Is it Alzheimer's disease? What do we want to do? What do we want to look at? So first thing is you want to get a good history and physical. You want to look at, uh, when we're talking about a number of the things, you want to look at their medications. You want to look at what's going on in their life. You want to look at their social issues. You want to look at their family issues. You want to look and see what's going on, because there may be a number of reasons why someone may have a decline that isn't Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of, a lot of things we want to look at. Want to look at their medications. We know that as we get older, we metabolize medications differently. So a medication I may have been on for 30 years that I've done fine with, as I get older, I may not deal as well with, and I may need a lower dose, or perhaps I've dealt well with this medication for 10 years, and I get put on another medication, and now the two of them together cause me problems. And so those are things we want to look at. Is it something I, I teach in the family medicine residency program, and I always tell the residents, no matter what you're looking at, the first question you've got to ask yourself is, is this something I'm doing to the patient? You know, you've got to look. Is there something we're, we're, we're giving to the patient that might be contributing to their symptoms? We've got to take a look at that. And then we want to do a good mental health and psychosocial evaluation. For example, we've seen a number of patients who are older whose parents develop Alzheimer's disease, and they're living with their parent. <laughs> and rather than the, and, the, and you look at the person with Down syndrome, for all intents and purposes, they look like they have Alzheimer's disease. But what it ends up being is that they're really they're mimicking the decline of their parent. And we've seen that. I, w I wouldn't only share this because we've seen it so many times. I'm absolutely convinced that it happens. Um, and so we've seen that, seen that. Other times, actually, the person there, unfortunately, I was just talking to someone today. Unfortunately, because of the earlier onset of Alzheimer's disease, you may actually have a situation where a person with Down syndrome and their parent is developing Alzheimer's disease at the same time. And that, that's a real challenge. And so sometimes it, the person with Down syndrome will decline more rapidly because a big chunk of their support system is deteriorating at the same time that they're deteriorating. And so it becomes a real problem. And so certainly siblings who are trying to deal with a sibling with Down syndrome and a parent developing Alzheimer's disease simultaneously is, is a very challenging, very challenging situation. We want to look at uh, thyroid problems. Uh, hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid can cause dementia. It's, it's, potent, it's reversible by treating with uh, thyroid medication. And about 40% of people with Down syndrome have an underactive thyroid, so it's a very common problem. Uh, vitamin B12 uh, can cause a, a potentially reversible dementia, uh, correct, a potentially reversible dementia if, if they're given vitamin B12 supplements. Uh, and again, that's uh, probably more, I think it's probably a little more common in people with Down syndrome 
uh, probably because of celiac disease is more common in people with Down syndrome, and celiac disease can cause vitamin deficiencies. You might look, you might look to see maybe diabetes or kidney problems or uh, liver issues. There may be a whole number of metabolic problems that manifest itself in a decline in skills. So those are things we want to take a look at. And again, celiac disease is more common in folks with Down syndrome and may cause some of the people to decline or seem to decline. We talked about gait issues and falling and, and, and not and, and being unsteady. Uh, we know that cervical subluxation, which is a, the first vertebrae slipping on the second, also called atlantoaxial instability. If your son or daughter, your brother or sister is ever, or the person you work with is ever participating in Special Olympics, you know they have to have an x-ray to, to, to rule that out. Uh, it's, again, it's more common in people with Down syndrome. And one of the symptoms of that is an unsteady gait. So sometimes you want to look at, you don't want to blame, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, a 30-year-old is developing Alzheimer's disease because they're unsteady, and you find that really what they need is not treatment for Alzheimer's disease, they need a surgical intervention to fix their neck. Uh, and that, again, that's very potentially reversible, so you don't want to miss that. We also might want to think about getting a CT scan or an MRI of the brain. Uh, what you're typically going to see on the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease is the brain is shrinking. But particularly early on, you may not see that. So it's, if you don't have it, it doesn't mean you don't have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and the other things you might be looking for would be brain tumors or things like that. As I mentioned, cancer is less common in people with Down syndrome, so the, the likelihood of the person with Down syndrome having a brain tumor is, is not high. So we find that the yield on a CT scan or an MRI of the brain of a person with Down syndrome tends to be pretty low. Um, and I did mention this later, so I'll just quick mention it. We do see a lot of our patients with Alzheimer's disease that undergo anesthesia don't do well with anesthesia. They don't recover in a typical fashion. So particularly in our folks that need anesthesia to cooperate with a CT or an MRI where the yield is likely to be low, the benefit is probably significantly less than the, the potential problems. And so we don't, we're not in a big rush to do that. Ten years ago, I was getting them on everybody. I've really kind of backed off on that just because the, the yield was so low. And then the other thing to think about is a sleep study. Sleep apnea, which is in people with Down syndrome, it tends to be obstructive sleep apnea where the person is breathing but the airway uh, occludes, and so they're not, the air is not moving. Sleep apnea is significantly more common in people with Down syndrome, and, in, and, uh, and it can cause a decline in skills. Uh, years ago, we saw a patient that, for all intents and purposes, was psychotic, was completely non-functional. This was a guy that was, you know, took the city bus to work every day, worked in a, a store someplace, very independent skills, and came in. It looked like he had developed psychosis and, and was very non-functional, and, and he snored, and, and no, someone had noticed some pause in his breathing. He got on a CPAP, uh, the treatment for sleep apnea, and all his symptoms went away. And so it can be pretty dramatic. And so it's certainly something to think about in our folks that, uh, that uh, are declining in skills. So if now we've decided that the person does have Alzheimer's disease, how many of our patients do have it? And what's, how does it compare to the rest of the population? These are just rough numbers, but these are, I, I, I think they're, pretty close to what we have seen. So in the general population, roughly in the 60s, it's about 10%. And that's about what we see in our patients in their 40s. In the general population in the, in the 70s, it's roughly 20%. And that's what we see in our patients in their 50s. And 40% in the 80s, and that's about what we see in our patients in their 60s. Over age 85 in the general population is thought to be as high as 50%. And so the, and we're not talking small numbers. Uh, but at least at this point, we're, we're still thinking at least clinically, it's not universal. Um, common, but not universal. And again, the average age of onset in our practice was about 20 years earlier than, than in people without Down syndrome. And again, in our practice, uh, the average age of onset in a, in a small study we did was uh, 52 uh, years, and the average age of death was about 55.9 years. So in our practice, the average from the onset of the symptoms to death was about 3.6 years. And I looked at a number of studies in the general population. I picked the one that was the shortest, and it suggested it was about 5.9 years, although some studies suggest that it's longer. Um, so it's significantly shorter, even if you look at the, the shortest estimation in people without Down syndrome. How do we treat uh, Alzheimer's disease? Well, there are, there are two categories of medications that are actually specifically 
available to treat Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, we've not been overly impressed with either one in our, in our practice. First, thing is a, first one is a category called cholinesterase inhibitors, and that includes medications like Aricept and Razadine. Um, and they block a, a, a chemical in the brain that actually uh, keeps acetylcholine around longer, so it's supposed to stimulate the cells better. Unfortunately, that really has not panned out well to far patients with Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, also, we, the uh, two uh, real problems we've seen with this is uh, oftentimes it, it, affect, it affects, uh, bless you, it affects appetite and causes our patients to lose weight, which is, can already be a complication of Alzheimer's disease. And the other thing that's associated with seizures, and seizures are already a potential complication of people with Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. So we've really not been overly impressed. I've tended uh, not, to, not to prescribe these. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we were, but we've really kind of gotten away from that because for the most part, because uh, we've not really found a whole lot of benefit. And then there's another medication, which is in a category all by itself. Uh, it's called Memenda or Memantine. Um, and it really looked like it was going to be the one. Uh, it really had, initially had, had some real positive uh, uh, studies in the general population. And so we started using our uh, patients. And we do see some of our patients do get good response to it. Not a lot of patients, but some. Uh, unfortunately, a lot don't. And then uh, a couple years ago, uh, there was a study done in uh, England. And, and they call it Down syndrome in England. We call it Down syndrome here in the States. But uh, um, they looked at uh, Nemenda in people with Down syndrome, and, and they found that it, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, and found that it was not beneficial. So that's the only study that I'm aware of at this point that's looked at people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease and Nemenda. I've talked to a lot of families about Nemenda. You know, we do. Some people seem to get better. Unfortunately, a lot of people we see get agitated with the Nemenda. And, and a smaller percentage, but a significant amount, gets sedated with Nemenda. So that can cause some significant problems. And the agitation is probably the biggest. Uh, we were t I was talking to Dan beforehand. I would say, as a rough guess, five to ten times the number of people that I thought got some benefit, I had to take off others for agitation. So the agitation is a real problem. And it can be pretty aggressive agitation, so it can be a real problem. So people have talked about, I should take vitamin this and mineral this and, and, and fish oil this and, and this. Unfortunately, none of that has really panned out in the general population. The only thing that seems to have any benefit at this point, and it's not huge, but it's some, uh, is exercise. And so regular exercise throughout your life might help prevent, and if you develop, might help slow it down. Might. And that's the only, that's the only thing we have, unfortunately, at this point. And so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging situation. So if we can't actually treat or cure Alzheimer's disease at this point, doesn't mean we can't do anything. There's a lot of things we're going to do. I'm going to focus on the medications, and Dan's going to look at a number of other things that we can do for folks to make their life uh, uh, better, if you will, as long, for as long as possible. And, and that's what we're going to focus on the rest here. So sleep is a common problem with people with Down syndrome. Oftentimes there's a day-night reversal, so people will be awake during the night and asleep during the day. And that can be a real problem for the caregiver, particularly if they're living at home and the caregiver has, uh, uh, also needs to sleep occasionally. Uh, um, maybe not quite as big of a concern in folks that live in a residential facility where there's eight-hour shift staff, but it's a problem nevertheless. But it's also a problem for the person with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease themselves because if they're awake during the night, then they're not awake during the day when the activities are going on and there's, there's opportunity to interact with other people, and, and you, so you lose a lot of other uh, things because you're not sleeping well. So melatonin is a, is a supplement that a lot of people have used when they're going across time zones uh, to kind of reset their clock to help them sleep, and we've had some success with it in, in folks with uh, Down syndrome and also folks with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And then trazodone is an antidepressant that we find doesn't work really very well as an antidepressant in folks with Down syndrome, but does work well as a sleep aid. And so we've used that in a number of, number of individuals. Uh, we mentioned urinary incontinence is, is common. Um, we don't want to just immediately blame an, a urinary incontinence on Alzheimer's disease. We want to look. They might have a urinary tract infection. They might have urinary retention. We just finished a small study in our patients, nothing to do with Alzheimer's disease, but a small study in our patients and found uh, uh, a small but significant number of our older patients developed urinary retention as they got older. And so they weren't, they weren't urinating as well. They weren't empty in their bladder. And so what happens is the bladder is very full and just periodically just sort of overflows, if you will. 
and so they develop incontinence for that reason. So that's something. That's actually, uh, some of you may have seen we have a bladder scanner in the office now. We just scan, have the person urinate and scan their, their abdomen and see if the, they're emptying their bladder well. And it a, seems to be a significant problem in some of our patients. And then overactive bladder, you've probably seen the commercial where the guys, you know, we've got to keep track on the bus everywhere, every bathroom in town is. But certainly we see that in some of our patients with Down syndrome as well. And so sometimes it's just an overactive bladder and there are medications to treat that as well. Unfortunately, that's a real conundrum because the medications that you would use to treat that can actually make Alzheimer's disease worse. And so that, that could be a real problem. And then the gait changes, you want to look for arthritis, or we mentioned the cervical subluxation. Um, arthritis in people with Down syndrome, again, is one of those conditions that seems to occur at a younger age. Interestingly, most of our patients with arthritis, not all of them, but most of our patients with arthritis, rather than having pain, have dysfunction of the joint. Now, we know certainly some have pain, but many have dysfunction of the joint. So they're, they're walking differently. Where you and I would be complaining of pain before the dysfunction of the joint, they're actually their first complaint is dysfunction of the joint. And so you want to take a look at that. Again, maybe with somebody with Alzheimer's disease and advanced Alzheimer's disease, you not want to take them to the OR to replace their hip, but there may be physical therapy, there may be medications, there may be other things that you can do to help them walk better uh, in the meantime. And then mood changes are common in folks with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And again, I'm just you know, mostly focused on the, on the medications here, and Dan's going to talk about some of the other issues. So the medications are not the first line. I, I just happen to be presenting first. So <laughs> they're actually in reverse order here as far as the, the use of them. Um, so first thing, you always want to assess for pain. Uh, if someone's having a mood change, you want to look to see if there's something. They might have a bladder infection. They, may have, you know, they might have you know, a boil. They might have any of a number of things that can make the person be more agitated or, be, or have a mood change. And we don't want to rush to sedating them. You know, the typical treatment for a boil is not Valium. You know, you want to go and look and see if they have a boil and, and, and treat that appropriately. Is there something going on in their environment that's causing them to be uh, challenged? Unfortunately, a lot of our patients, as the disease progresses, their world of comfort shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And so they, don't, they begin to not want to leave their environment. Uh, it can be real challenging for families because oftentimes, if, particularly if they live in a residential facility, going home to the family home can become very challenging. And, that, and that's hard on, and that, I understand, that's hard on families, but it's unfortunate the reality of the situation for, for a lot of our patients. Um, and then sleep, are they, are they not sleeping well? And is there something we can do to help them sleep better? Because that might help their mood as well. De part of the mood change you might see is depression. Depression is more common in people with uh, um, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so we might want to look at using uh, what are called the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as uh, sertraline or Zola, all the, the other name is Zoloft, or citalopram or Celexa. Interesting, in, again, it has been studying folks with Down syndrome, but just about six or five or six weeks ago, an article came out that so, showed that citalopram, which is an antidepressant, actually helps with agitation in people with Alzheimer's disease in the general population. So I've started to use that in some of our patients with agitation. Uh, when we couldn't find another non-medicinal way to, to help them through this challenge. And then a, a kind of a cousin of the, uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors is this, are the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. It had to have been a scientist that came up with those names. Um, and then uh, I'll just mention there's several of them, but I'll just mention one. Deloxetine, also called Cymbalta, also has an indication for a number of chronic pain uh, syndromes. Uh, and so we find that some of our patients that have Alzheimer's disease and pain, uh, that this one's beneficial to them because it, it helps not only with the depression, but also helps with, with the, the, the pain issues. And so we've seen some success with that. And then aggressive behavior. And this, this one, obviously, it, it can be the most challenging and, and the most disturbing, and the one that we certainly want to, to help with. And Dan's going to have a number of suggestions for non-medicinal things, again, as well, that we want to talk about. Um, but again, you want to assess for pain. You want to look at the sleep. You want to look at the environment. Is there anything we can do that to, to help them not feel threatened or feel agitated or fearful? Uh, and, and I always like to think about, you know, if, if every day I woke up and everything was new, that would be pretty frightening. And so how do we help people keep familiar with their environment? Uh, and we're going to talk about, Dan, I think Dan's going to talk about some of those things here shortly. So fear is a, is a huge issue here. Um, Sometimes we use, uh, interesting, the seizure medications can help some of this aggressive behavior. Uh, some of the anti-anxiety medications, such as Ativan or Clonopin, can be helpful. Uh, 
Um, the antipsychotics can be helpful. In the general population, really discouraged from using them because there's a higher incidence of stroke than people with Alzheimer's disease who use these medications. Stroke does seem to be less common in people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, so I'm a little less reluctant to use them, but not a lot less reluctant. So we still try to use them as a much further down the road uh, use rather than um, uh, some of these other choices. And then again, the seizures are common in folks with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. Um, there's also a, a form, seizures can be a wide variety of, of forms, and one of the things we see is what's called myoclonic jerking. And what that looks like is, it, it, you know, we tend to think of a seizure, I mean, the most common, when we think of a seizure, most commonly think of, you know, the person falling down and shaking repeatedly and, and having incontinence, and, and you know, that's a, called a, a tonic-clonic seizure. It used to be called a grand mal seizure. Um, but there's also a wide variety of other types of seizures. And one of the things we see in folks with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's oftentimes it's called myoclonic jerking. It might be just one jerk periodically. You know, it might happen once a day, it might happen several times a day. Oftentimes we don't treat those because the treatment ends up being worse than the myoclonic jerking. So if you just have an occasional jerking of your arm uh, or your leg, not, doesn't seem to be that big of a problem for the person. If it's happening repeatedly enough that they can't feed themselves because their arm is flapping so much with the jerking, or if it's knocking them down because it's, you know, the jerking of their legs or their whole torso, you know, then certainly we, those folks we would look at potentially treating with anti-seizure medications. I'm not going to go through the whole list of the anti-seizure medications. There are a whole bunch of them that, that can help. I'm just going to mention one. It's Keppra or Levetiracetam. Works wonderfully for seizures. Unfortunately, one of the side effects is agitation. And we've had a number of patients we've had to take off because they got significantly more agitated on Keppra. Uh, when, when they've developed Alzheimer's disease and seizures. So wonderful <coughs> drug for seizure control, tends to be safe, not have to do a lot of blood work like you do with some of the older medications. Unfortunately, it has this one side effect that can be very disturbing. So I'm going to stop and turn it over to Dan, and then when Dan's finished, we'll uh, save some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shacoin. Excellent uh, overview of the medical aspects of Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. Uh, thanks to Mary Lee and Grace for the invitation to speak tonight, to share the podium with Dr. Shacoin, a living legend right here in our midst. Um, I represent Rainbow Hospice and Palliative Care, a 33-year-old nonprofit organization, probably known to many of you here. Uh, interesting organization born out of uh, uh, Resurrection Hospital and uh, Lutheran, Lutheran General Hospital. Uh, we still have shared governance, but we're our own um, nonprofit, 501c3. And um, we've been serving uh, people with a variety of terminal illnesses, uh, including uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias. And I, I joined the organization about three and a half years ago because of my specialty in Alzheimer's disease. So we've seen a tremendous growth in the number of people uh, with Alzheimer's and other related dementias. Uh, on any given day, probably a third of our 300-plus patients have dementias or terminal diagnosis. So a rather large and growing concern for all of us at Rainbow and certainly society as a whole. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, what we might call the non-medical or psychosocial aspects of the disease. Very little time. Uh, hopefully, as Mary Lee suggested, this might be a part of a continuing series, because uh, I could probably talk all night about this. So all this is really about providing the best possible care. As Dr. Coyne pointed out, uh, we don't really have any disease-modifying drugs. There's no way to, to stop it. Uh, it has, of course, all of its own, and it and it, uh, and it ends in death prematurely. So really, uh, we're not talking about cure here or even really highly effective treatment. And so this, this, we have to shift our focus to thinking about providing the best quality of life, the best quality of care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And one of the challenges for people with Alzheimer's disease, well, the loss of skills and their ability to manage their own self-care, uh, their, their ability to do work, their ability to come and go. Also, their communication skills are invariably <coughs> affected. And of course, this can affect their self-image. It can result certainly in depression and anxiety and fear. And it does change their relationships because many people will start to shy away from those who are constantly repeating themselves in conversation, who might act in a rather unusual kind of way. And in some cases, it may actually lead to a change in living situation. For those who, who are living in a private home, they may be forced into a care facility 
but those who are in a group home, they might actually have to go to a long-term care facility. So there are profound challenges for people living with Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. And what is a good quality of life? Well, that's highly subjective. You know, what's good for you might not be good for me. Uh, everybody should have their own say. But for the most part, I think it means, you know, enabling people to do what they can still do. Uh, maximizing abilities, I know, is, is a watchword in, in caring for this population. And certainly uh, people with, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, regardless of age or circumstance, they should be enabled to do what they can still do for themselves instead of becoming uh, dependent upon others. Um, also, <coughs> this means educating family and friends as to the nature of their condition and, and helping to provide a supportive environment who are for people who are forgetful, who are disoriented, who are becoming increasingly disabled. Uh, it means surrounding them with, with love and affection. Um, it also means uh, helping them to maintain their mobility as long as possible. And again, physical exercise, maybe to reduce the risk for Alzheimer's disease as well as maybe to slow down progression. It means being socially engaged in a variety of one-to-one -one and group activities. This could be through a structured activity program or just outings with family members and friends. Also, we're finding a great promise in the use of creative arts, particularly music, uh, art making, art watching, um, poetry. A lot of, a lot of these uh, creative arts, I think, hold great value for people with Alzheimer's disease, regardless of, uh, um, of, of age and circumstance. And then lastly, sensory stimulation. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Dr. Coyne mentioned uh, aggressive behaviors, and that falls under the rubric of what I call challenging behaviors. Um, and there's several possible reasons. Um, and something that I call caregiver triggers. These are our, our uh, family and friends and, 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 and staff members who uh, insist upon reasoning with people who, who have Alzheimer's disease, who, who are pushing them to do things they can no longer do uh, on their own, and it's causing a great deal of anxiety <coughs> and fear. And so they're backing off, they're becoming apathetic, they're becoming depressed because other people are not really understanding what they need and are not being supportive. And one way I, um, I, I try to illustrate this is by means of this illustration. So you all see the horse, correct? By the way, this is not a test for Alzheimer's, all right? <laughs> this is one of these funny pictures where there's, there's actually two, two animals in this picture. Can, can anybody see the other animal? The frog. There is a frog. Very good. There is a frog. All right, now this is an analogy. I'm not saying people with Alzheimer's disease see frogs, although that would be a true hallucination, okay? <laughs> so if you turn your head to, to the right, you'll see a large frog sitting on a lily pad. Or in your handouts, you can see it as well. So here's the analogy that, you know, we all live in a world of objective truth and reality to the extent possible. We, we, we use our senses to figure things out and to communicate effectively with one another. People with Alzheimer's disease are losing their, their skill level. They're losing their ability to navigate safely in the environment. They're losing the ability to manage their own self-care. They sometimes say and do things that are a little bit off. They might be time traveling to an earlier period in their life. It's up to us to support them to the extent possible in their worldview. This is all about adopting their perspective on the world. Our, our brains are capable of expanding to suit their needs. We need to get in their groove to the extent possible. All right? So if they say, for example, it's 1983 and we know it's 2014, what is the point of arguing? I love to say, if you argue with somebody with Alzheimer's, you get what you deserve. <laughs> you're not going to win, and they're going to forget about it. <laughs> so we need to do a little course correction here in, in, in adapting to their worldview. And I think this enables them to feel safe and comfortable and loved by people who really understand that objective truth and reality, well, we need to bend it a little bit. All right, we shouldn't be reasoning and arguing with people with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Coyne pointed out, sometimes people are suffering from some kind of a physical pain, or they might have some comorbidity that needs treatment. There might be a, a, a tooth decay going on, for example. This can induce agitation and, and depression. So all these things have got to be ruled out. We shouldn't automatically assume that it's Alzheimer's disease causing them to act in a, an aggressive way, uh, 
They might be losing their inhibitions. They might be cursing for the first time in their life. So there's all kinds of possibilities at work here. But I always point the finger at us, the caregivers, because this is where we have some control. But we got to be good detectives, too, in detecting maybe there are some uh, physical triggers that are causing them to, to feel some pain and worry. And then lastly, what I call environmental triggers, all right? If the environment is too noisy, if it's too crowded, people with Alzheimer's disease don't deal well with a lot of stress. They get easily overloaded by confusion, all right? So they do best in one-to-one -one conversations. And that means avoiding large family gatherings, people talking all at once. You know what I'm talking about. We all have this experience, family gatherings and celebrations. <laughs> There's a lot going on. People with Alzheimer's disease can't filter this stuff out, and they want to go home, they want to run away. We need to minimize this kind of confusion for them. All right. So let's talk about some communication challenges that, that they all have with, who have Alzheimer's disease. You know, the repeating the same question over and over and over and over again. The problem for us is we remember all those repetitions, all right, but they don't. They do they don't remember that they forget. Can you wrap your head around that? All right. When you and I are reminded of something, we are thankful for the, the recollection. We, we have that aha moment. Oh, I forgot, we say to ourselves. But these folks perhaps have no awareness of their forgetfulness. And some of them are having a hard time finding the right word in conversation. Again, we all, we all have this experience now and then, right, as we are all forgetful. They may have difficulty naming objects or people. Uh, and they will have difficulty keeping pace with conversation. So this means we've got to learn to slow down. By the middle stages, and the rate of progression varies from person to person, as Dr. Shacoin mentioned, um, there may be diminished vocabulary and grammar. They may be mixing up their, their tenses. The past and the present may bl blend together. Um, and again, they're having more and more problems keeping pace with conversation particularly if there's two or three people around. They will be lost. And they're unable to follow a three-step command or follow directions. So they need basically step-by-step -step directions to get things done. Simple things like brushing teeth, combing hair. By the late stages, we, we see a severe impairment in, uh, in language as well as in comprehension. They may even develop what we call a word salad. A lot of words, but not necessarily in the proper order. And by this point, even a two-step command may be problematic for them. And by the final stages, people that we see at Rainbow Hospice, for example, there may be few un uh, intelligible words, or they may lose their speech altogether. Uh, and they become very, very passive. They need full-time care at this point in time. Okay. So based on what I was just sharing about and you know, diminished communication skills, we have to strive towards eliminating background noise, principally people, but also radio, TV, anything that's causing them to be easily distracted. It means talking to them on a one-to-one -one basis. This will represent a departure, perhaps, from the way we always have visits in groups of people and celebrations. It means making direct eye contact as people um, lose some of their physical abilities, they may lose the ability to walk. And so can you imagine anything more intimidating than someone standing over you if you are in a wheelchair? All right? That's why I love this picture. This is my friend Mary Beth talking to a man with Alzheimer's disease. This, this makes an immediate connection, eye level, and making that, that eye contact establishes warmth. And you notice she's grabbing her, his hand. So using touch is very, very important to establish that meaningful connection. And of course, smiling. A lot of this means we're going to have to learn a whole new way of communicating, relying less and less on words and more on nonverbal means of communication. As I said, learning not to argue, not to correct someone. There's a tendency, you know, to live in this cerebral world, but we've got to resist the temptation to set people straight. And we have to take time to listen very, very carefully. Um, and we have to choose our words carefully and our tone of voice very carefully, too, all right? If people are having a hard time, we need to validate their feelings. And again, people with Alzheimer's disease think slowly, they remember slowly, 
And so we've got to slow down with them. Whenever I'm dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's disease, whether it's the early stages or the final stages, I have got to get into this certain mindset that they are impaired. They are suffering brain damage in a significant way, and I've got to tailor my communication to match their skill level. So this means using short, simple sentences. All right. In, in my own mind, I, I try to come up with a 10-word test. If, if I'm using more than 10 words to communicate a single message, that's probably enough. All right? Some of us go on and on and on and on and on. We tell stories. That might have been appropriate at one time in this person's life. No longer is the case. All right? We need to use cues and gestures. We need to point. Uh, and we need to limit choices. All right? So if you ask somebody with all sorts of things, what would you like to do today? That's an open-ended kind of question, and it's pretty meaningless, all right? But if you say, would you like to go to, for a walk right now or have a snack? Two clear choices. They'll be able to give you their decision, all right? So we've got to be as concrete as possible in giving them choices. Red sweater, blue sweater, instead of what would you like to wear today, all right? And, of course, breaking down tasks. I mentioned the problems with two- and three-step commands. So talking them through things so that they can do things on their own. Clearly, this requires extraordinary patience on the part of caregivers. And this is not for the faint of heart. And it's not for just one person. I always caution people never to try to do this alone because you can easily get burned out in the process. This is somebody whose brain is not going to recover, who's going to diminish slowly over time, and this requires Great skill and patience and compassion to do this kind of work. And no matter how much you love someone, it's not, it's not realistic to do this kind of work by yourself. And I'll talk more about that. But breaking down tasks is really a way to preserve uh, whatever skill level is left. If you think about it, our, our five senses were the, were the original ways that we learned, to, uh, we, we learned about the world. And, and touch was probably the most significant way we were reassured by our, our, our parents, our caregivers, that we were loved and cared for. So, so th this is a memory that is never lost, no matter how impaired we may become due to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I, I believe our five senses were our first and our last language, and touch above all. So gentle touch is really an important way to reach out and connect with people with Alzheimer's disease and reassure them that they, uh, even though they might feel afraid, we have a great chance of of showing that, that they are safe and cared for. So I want to talk a little bit about challenges for family, friends, and caregivers. But let me sh go back to our uh, video just for a moment, because Anne is going to talk about how she had to wrap her head around this diagnosis for her son, Jim. So she really had to, to rethink the relationship with him. You know, he... She geared her life towards maximizing his potential and saw all his, his learning start to unravel over time. So she, again, had to accommodate herself. Um, I, I really like this particular video. She shows resilience. I think anybody who has uh, lived with somebody with Down syndrome, has given birth to somebody with Down syndrome, there's that, there's that initial jolt, that, that, that sense of disbelief about what's going on. And I think some of those same feelings then carry over to this diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But I always hold out hope to people who are grappling with this to say, listen, you've had a lifetime of experiences. You never thought that this person could do what they have learned to do, and you can learn to adapt to this as well. I think this is the great hope that in spite of this adversity, that you can get your arms around this and you can dedicate yourself to ensuring a good quality of life for somebody who has Alzheimer's disease at this stage of their life. But again, it requires adjusting one's expectations, coming up with a new set of communication skills, rethinking the relationship, and getting everybody on the same page. It means telling your friends and other family members what you are learning and observing so that they're not arguing, so that they're not reasoning, so that they're learning to do one-to-ones instead of coming together as, as a big group of people and overwhelming somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Clearly, because of the growing impairments, somebody with Alzheimer's is going to need more and more time and energy from loved ones. Um, 
as, as Anne pointed out, there's the sense of loss. And I think the, the grief is quite real. And, and to deny that is it, it, it's just not realistic. To, to feel sad about it and maybe even angry about it, I think it's just part of coming to terms with the grief that everybody experiences in the course of Alzheimer's disease. But once you face those feelings, you can move on over that. I've seen a lot of people get stuck in their grief. They get stuck in depression. They can't move on. And it's neither good for them nor for the person that they're caring for. Obviously, people with Alzheimer's disease are going to need more and more help uh, with dressing and bathing and toiling. Uh, so there's physical effort involved. And perhaps one of the biggest challenges of all for family and friends is managing their own self-care. As I alluded to already, providing care is a very, very taxing endeavor. And you can lose yourself in this. You, you can spend yourself physically and emotionally and spiritually and really get caught up in a sense of frustration or a deep depression. So caring for one's own physical well-being, one's own emotional well-being, one's own spiritual well-being is really essential to, um, to not only survive this, but maybe even thrive in the midst of it and to ensure good quality of care for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. This takes a village to do this kind of thing. So it all begins, I believe, with education. That's why I'm so glad you're here tonight. Um, attending lectures, reading books, maybe even participating in support groups is a great way to come to terms with this. Of course, getting a diagnosis, but after that, learning uh, the ins and outs of this, learning coping strategies, uh, getting support from other families and friends who are coping with this. And of course, to do some uh, what we call advanced care planning, recognizing that this person's life is going to be shortened by this disease and that care decisions are going to have to be made, whether or not to, for example, use a, a, a feeding tube, whether uh, to pursue aggressive measures uh, with various diagnostic tests, or whether to pursue what we call palliative or comfort care in all decisions. Also to consider, you know, getting this person involved in some kind of an activity program, for people who were working, maybe they need to go to a modified work program or enroll in a senior activity program uh, or what, I, what we might call an adult day program. Also perhaps hiring help, uh, non-medical home care agencies to share uh, the burden of some of that physical, physical care as well as providing uh, supervision and companionship. As I mentioned, it might require a change in location of care. It might there might be the need to plan ahead for the possibility of moving from uh, a group home into a long-term care facility. I believe that all uh, organizations that are devoted to this population are really uh, developing a sense of urgency about this because of the growing number of people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, our, our state is not really, uh, our state and federal governments have not really met the challenge of Alzheimer's disease in the general population, let alone the population with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. So we really have got to advocate for more funding to ensure that people can live in their homes where they have lived for years, if not decades. It's going to require a lot more money than we have available today. And of course, hospice at the end of life. Uh, according to Medicare and Medicaid, that means that life expectancy is six months or less. You can avail yourself to a team of physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplains, music and massage therapists, and trained volunteers. And our entire goal is to ensure the comfort of that individual who's terminally ill and to care for those who are grieving through our uh, so-called bereavement services. And I see one of our bereavement counselors here tonight, Diane Barunas. Okay. So we have uh, support groups uh, and, and, and programs for the bereaved as well. So I just want to end by talking about a few uh, resources you should know about. The Alzheimer's Association, which is based here in Chicago on Michigan Avenue, they've got a wonderful library full of resources. The Greater Illinois chapter is just down the road on, on Cumberland. Um, so you can call them 24-7, toll-free helpline. If you're up in the middle of the night, give them a call. Test their 24-7 helpline. <laughs> they've got a great website. It's chock full of fact sheets, some uh, uh, web videos, also a government website, uh, just terrific, Alzheimer's Disease Education Referral Center. Again, they open, they have a, a toll-free uh, line as well, but they're not 24-7. It's the government, okay? 
And if you're interested in some of those bigger issues, the policy issues as well as some of the practical care issues, this document uh, at the bottom of the page uh, just came out a couple of years ago about trying to develop a national strategy for meeting this, uh, this growing crisis. And I've, I've written uh, a bunch of things, but I would recommend uh, if you're just beginning down this path, uh, the third edition of my book, Alzheimer's Early Stages, came out in, uh, in September. Um, also, uh, just to highlight the importance of music, I would recommend this wonderful website, which uh, is with the launching pad for a documentary that will hopefully be appearing in the local area very soon called Alive Inside. And it points out the great benefits of listening to music for people with Alzheimer's disease, recorded music. You can go to this website and, and, and check out a number of really fascinating clips. Um, so again, it's one of these non-cognitive kinds of things that all of us can enjoy with people with Alzheimer's disease. I also co-authored a 22-page uh, uh, document that is free, available uh, for families who have a loved one living in care facilities. So I would recommend you go there. You can download this for free. Now let me just finish with this quote. This is about a century old quote, but I think it holds true today as it did 100 years ago, that we're more than our cognition. We're more than our memory. All right. At our essence, we are heart and soul. And so that's where we can really still touch people. This is something that is accessible to all of us. All right. So let me finish there and we'll entertain any questions or comments or stories. We have a group of people upstairs. Okay. So obviously we had limited time, but we thought uh, we would take any questions. Was there more to the video? There's a lot more to that video. Um, I, I can provide the link. Yeah. Actually, I was going to ask Dan. I, I will put my slides up on the on our Facebook page and our and our blog so you can see them easily. Uh, and uh, um, also, I was going to ask Dan about the possibility of doing his slides oh, sure. as well as the link to the video. So, uh, if you're not on the, you don't actually have to be on. And a lot of people like to be on Facebook, but you don't have to be on Facebook to see a Facebook page. If you just Google Adult Down Syndrome Clinic Facebook, you can't comment on the page, but you can see everything that's on there. So I would, uh, uh, and we'll put that over in the next few days. Um, Just down Adult Down Syndrome Clinic Facebook, yeah. Does that have the audio along with it then when you put it up? Or just the slide? Well, uh, well that's the slide part. I'm also, if, if all well works in the world, this is recording. Right. And if all that works well, eventually this will be on YouTube. Um, hopefully. <laughs> that part was a little weaker. <laughs> We're working on it. The question was how many people we've seen here. Um, we've seen about 5,500 adolescents and adults with Down syndrome. Over the last 22 plus years. So I, as I was listening to Dan's talk, I, I was thinking that this, it must have sounded a little bit like the good cap, cop and the bad cop. And, and Dan had the good cop <laughs> role. <laughs> um, but I, but I, I, you know, honestly, I don't think I would do the families justice if we sugarcoated this. I mean, it, this is a tough, I've dealt with this in my own family. This is, this is not a good thing. It's a challenging thing. Uh, but it, it can be a good thing from the sense of dealing with uh, the spiritual and the other nature, the things that Dan talked about. So we can make the best of it that we can. Um, but I think overall, it, it's a challenging thing, and, and there's just no way around that. And, but we try to make the best of it we can. So I, I sort of laid out the challenges that most of you know about already, and Dan uh, gave you some real good ideas, I think, on ways to, to help make the best of this as we can. Can you kind of summarize the stages as we can see them? Nope. Yeah. You know, a lot of, you know, 
questions about stages, and, and there's a lot of certain lot of discussion about this in the general population. I, I think it's a little more challenging our folks because it doesn't necessarily look the same in, in our folks. As general, as, you know, so uh, a lot of people would suggest that people with Down syndrome, the, the first thing tends to be mood and behavioral changes um, as an early, very early stage. I don't all we don't always see that. Um, seizures may sometimes be part of the very early process in our folks, although that may be later as well. Um, certainly, short-term memory tends to be part tends to be part of the early stages. So those are probably the the main components. As it progresses, we tend to see more and more bodily dysfunction as well. Incontinence, walking issues, swallowing issues begin you know begin to be more of an issue. Certainly, the the long-term memory will go uh, as well as the short-term. And then as we get into the the, the later, I mean, some people have, you know, nine stages and seven stages. I, you know, I, I don't know that that's helpful. I mean, I, I think in just sort of beginning, middle, and end, I think is probably a, a reasonable one, two, and three. And the end stage certainly tends to be where people uh, tend not to be able to walk. The swallowing is very problematic. Um, and then they develop a lot of other, unfortunately, health issues. You know, as we, although we tend to think of Alzheimer's disease as a disease of the brain, in the end it becomes a disease of the whole body because the brain isn't telling the body what to do. And so people develop a lot of other problems, unfortunately. I, I wonder if you could go back to the seizure issue. Um, you said, you know, probably wouldn't do anything but just a flapping of the arm. But what are, what's the extent of the seizure that we might see? The, and I'll repeat this just so everyone can hear. The, the extent of the seizure, the question is what's the extent of the seizures? And it may be oh, really the, the gamut of seizure possibilities, all the way from a grand mal seizure where people will, uh, or tonic-clonic seizure, what it's now called, where people actually shake and fall and, and have incontinence and be uh, unaware during the seizure and then have what's called a post-ictal state where they'll be kind of uh, confused for a period of time, uh, all the way to things where people you know, uh, may just sort of be absent for several seconds, um, you know, may have a, a seizure where they're, uh, there's just a little bit of a, a temporary mood change or a, a, a personality change. So it can really be anything, you know, and, and all, you know, to the, just the occasional myoclonic jerking. So it can really be the gamut of seizures um, that are possible. Could you talk a little bit about hallucinations? Yeah, the question's about hallucinations. Now, and I didn't include it here because it's a part of the study that I, I think is probably not as good because it's a little harder to, to get that information from a lot of our patients. It's hard to know for sure if they are or not hallucinating. We actually found less hallucinations in our patients with Down syndrome than, than is quoted in the general population. And I'm not sure that really is less or whether it's just harder to, to assess. And so I think it certainly goes on. People uh, do have difficulty with, uh, you know, seeing things that aren't, that, we don't think are there, uh, don't appear to be there. Uh, it becomes a problem. Um, I, I think that, that we see a lot of our patients uh, from from very early on do self-talk and have imaginary friends, and it's very it's part and parcel to the great majority of our patients. Uh, it's very very common, and so we don't tend to think of that as as psychotic uh, in nature. That's just part and parcel to the developmental stage that a lot of our patients are at. So when they develop Alzheimer's disease and then hallucinate, it can be hard to tell whether they're just right. still have an imaginary, their imaginary friends, they're talking to themselves. So I think it's hard to assess, but clearly some of our patients do uh, have seizures. We see a, a, a lot of people that will, probably the most common thing I see is people picking up things that the rest of us can't see. I see, I see a lot of this in the office. So I would say that's probably the most common, common thing we see. We would probably call that a benign hallucination. That that would be that would be benign. Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, you know the the, the the boogeyman's chasing me down the street kind of thing. I, I hear very infrequently. I mean, that that kind of thing is not common. Now, whether the person is experiencing it and can't tell us is certainly a possibility. But uh, but at least we have not gotten a lot of reports of that. How do you deal with the bad behavior? I mean, do you, when they're doing something they're not supposed to do. Um, like with my brother, if he does something he's not supposed to be doing, and I correct him, it just makes him matter. So the question is, how do you deal with a bad behavior? Dan, you want to tackle that? Oh, that's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> he says, tug it cheek. Well, 
I think we have to challenge our own assumptions about what is bad behavior. Clearly, if someone is doing something unsafe, you know, for their own protection, uh, we, we need to intervene, all right? They can, they can use bad judgment. Uh, going, going outside without a coat in the wintertime, clearly a dangerous kind of thing. Uh, but a lot of this stuff I have found to be uh, relatively minor, uh, and it's really up to the family and friends to sort of ratchet down their expectations. So what might have been, what you might consider bad in the, in the past might not be so bad anymore because you've got to pick your fights carefully. You, you, you do run the risk of incurring someone's wrath and, and exploding in a fit of rage or even violence. So it's all about the approach and, and trying to expand our minds to figure out, is this really bad behavior on their part or is it just sort of upsetting for us? So I always pose the question to caregivers, whose problem is it, all right? Maybe it's not a problem for them, it's a problem for us. So we need to adjust our expectations. Obviously, if someone's doing something unsafe, we have to intervene, okay? Um, but then again, uh, it's all about the approach and sort of ratcheting this down. And maybe you're not the right person to intervene. Maybe there's somebody else who's got uh, maybe more authority or a more gentle way. It's interesting how people respond to different people in different ways, okay? So somebody, um, you know, a big hulking guy might come in and be very authoritative and the person will back down. Then again, there might be a sweet, demure little woman who is far more creative in, in, in her ability to get somebody to, to calm down. So you gotta figure out who are those key people in this particular situation. I think the other thing we've seen is uh, with uh, behavior challenges, we've seen a number of our patients that ended up moving to a nursing home that actually we were able to get off of a number of the medications they were on for behavior problems. And, and, and it's what I call the bingo pace. They get to a point in life where going to work and going to this and going to that just becomes too much for them and they react behaviorally. And when we slow down the pace, uh, things get significantly better uh, for many, many, many patients. So it, it can be a challenge to really look and see, is there something in the environment that's kind of triggering this? Um, you know, I think that the other thing I think Dan talked about is, is uh, earlier about, um, I forget what you meant talking about, oh, when they, they're trying to reason with a person with Alzheimer's disease, just oftentimes just taking a step back uh, and, and just letting the person sort of play it out. And then uh, obviously if it's a safety issue, that's not acceptable. I've heard it described that the best place for a person with Down syndrome, with Alzheimer's, excuse me, with Alzheimer's disease is to have a large fenced in yard where they can't get out into, they can't get out of, out in unsafe areas. And then there's corners where there's different things that they can do but don't have to do. There's enough space where they could just do nothing. Um, and then just set, kind of set their own pace at that. And that, that seems to, that sort of approach does seem to work for a, for a lot of people. Uh, obviously not everyone has a large fenced in backyard, but you know, that, that mentality I think is a, it's a good analogy. Most um, police departments have these wristbands now. You can get for a person with Alzheimer's. So if they wander away, they're, um, that's a good point. Well, wandering certainly is, is a concern, and, and uh, so uh, uh, police departments, uh, you can might contact your local police department, see if they have wristbands that they have uh, keyed into their electronic system so that the person is findable. And, and you might find things, on, there's things online as well that you can find that if your local town does not have those. Yeah, the Alzheimer's Association has something called the uh, Safe Return Program, combined now with GPS technology. And believe it or not, there are now GPS shoes. <laughs> you could buy these online in different colors and sizes for men and women alike. You could put this on your kids. You could put this on your grandkids. You could put it on people who wander. So I believe technology is really going to uh, be the thing that will, uh, you know, cut down on a lot of this unsafe wandering. Now, my son, he's 57. He was just diagnosed two months ago. And he has a problem. He's starting to complain. He can't swallow. He can't swallow. What do I do there? Uh, the statement was a 57-year-old diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease two months ago, developing problems with swallowing. Yes. Right. So uh, again, as I mentioned, this is unfortunately a common thing in our folks. Uh, the first thing we will typically do is refer them to a speech therapist, uh, and oftentimes we'll get a. Uh, sometimes the therapist will just do a, uh, a swallow evaluation, uh, just the therapist, 
oftentimes what we have them do is actually do a video swallow. Well, they'll actually uh, do a video. Uh, they'll they'll uh, give them food that's laden with uh, some barium, and they'll have them eat and drink that. And they'll watch it go down, and the speech therapist will be assessing at the same time the radiologist is looking at the x-rays. And that gives us an idea of what foods uh, the person can or may not be able to eat. So sometimes we'll end up changing the diet. It might end up being more of a pureed diet. It might have, That's what I've been doing. Yeah, that we yes. thicken the liquids. Yes. Janet didn't mention it. Yeah. Cut it small. Cut small pieces. Yes. Yeah. It seems to be, but I wanted to know. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if it becomes a progressive problem, we'll certainly want to get a video swallow at some point to get a, to what, what is the optimal diet. Uh, we often find, just as with our, a lot of our folks have swallowing problems when they don't have Alzheimer's disease, um, and, and I call a lot of our patients have what I call the one and down, one chew and down it goes. Um, and so trying to get people to slow down, cut it into small pieces, ask them to try to put the fork down between bites and take a sip. So fork, mm -hmm. sip, fork, sip. Uh, that seems to help with some people. So just trying to slow people down can make a big difference. So sometimes it's something a little simple, but unfortunately with Alzheimer's disease, it does tend to be progressive, and, and we're going to have to look at uh, looking at other ways to try to help them swallow them. But I recognize so many things that you were talking about. Two months, only two months, I recognize. That you're seeing it. Yeah. <coughs> Is there a nursing home that you're associated with and we can go to Yeah, we, um, several years ago, Park Ridge Care Center, which is, uh, I, I, my only association with it is that I admit patients there. I have no other association with Park Ridge. And, well, I'm their medical director, but that's, uh, I don't own it or anything like that. Um, I, I have to make that disclosure. Um, so anyway, several years ago, Park Ridge Care Center uh, started taking some of our patients. We now have almost the whole place. It's about 45, uh, 45 beds. The nice thing about it, it's one story, it's small, and they play a lot of bingo. Um, and, and I always say, um, you know, the, the real thing about Parker, it's, it's an older building, so, you know, aesthetically maybe it's not, you know, the, the brand new uh, nursing homes that you might see, but the staff makes up for, for that 50 times over. Uh, the staff is tremendous, and they're calm, and they're gentle, and they, you know, if, if someone's having a problem, agitation or something, they back off, and they let them kind of run through it, and then they, you know, keep them safe, and, and they just do a tremendous, they must have listened to Dan's lecture, because everything they, <laughs> everything they do, Dan talks about. They do. It's, it's on Bussy Highway in Park Ridge. Yeah, if you go to the, basically go to down Greenwood to, uh, down here, Greenwood is the sort of next major street west of us. You go south to, to uh, Bussy Highway, take a right, and it's uh, it's right there. Yeah. When living in a group home and there's 12 others, how how do you manage it when um, you know one that has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she's asked to take her meds because there's a certain time to take meds and she just left it set there? Um, how best for you know they ask her to do something else, take a shower or whatever, and, or pick up her bags and take them to her room. She's becoming more and more non-cooperative. And I mean, how, how can, you know, they've got 12 living there. It's got to be very hard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So about a group home situation. Um, so I would hesitate to say that she's becoming uncooperative. She's simply unable to be cooperative, okay? And I think there's an important distinction there because it boils down to expectations. If the staff are saying, you did this, and they're getting irritated with her, with her failure to follow through, that can create a rift in the relationship. And so she's going to start to feel bad about herself, and they might point the finger at her that she's being a, a, a she's a behavioral problem, okay? But... I think it all boils down, to, again, to education of the staff. I've been called into many group homes to make sure that the staff are understanding exactly what they're dealing with and to talk to the residents as well. Mm -hmm. And I have found great compassion. Once, once people understand what's going on, mm -hmm. that light bulb goes on. They, you know, and I have to be very, very simple in explaining to uh, the residents what, what's going on here. But once I, I, I laid out to them that, you know, this person is suffering from some brain damage and is sick, mm -hmm. you know, the words like she is ill, she is sick, people are, are really quick to say, oh, I feel so sorry for her. I want to care for her. And they will rally to, to, to help out. 
So it means getting everybody understanding the point of view of the person with Alzheimer's disease. Right. And I think they do that. And they do okay. it so well. And even the other uh, residents, they just all want to help so much. Good. Good. So Good. That makes all the difference in terms of quality of life. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the, um, I agree with Dan 100%. We've seen a number of our patients that develop Alzheimer's disease that live in residential facilities that it ends up actually in a, in a strange sort of way being good for the other people they live with mm -hmm. because it really gives them an opportunity to be caregivers. Mm -hmm. And it can, be, it can be a wonderful experience. On the other hand, as the disease progresses, and those of you that are living with, with it, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And some of our patients with an intellectual disability at some point find that difficult. Mm -hmm. And so for our patients that end up having to move, if you will, to a, to a different facility, that unfortunately ends up being one of the reasons sometimes, just because of the, the, the people around them find that too difficult. But I think if, if, we, if we do what Dan talks about, we can delay that or perhaps prevent that uh, by helping everybody participate in the process and understand it. But it, it is challenging. It's hard to know if, you know, for the caregivers, for the staff and whatever, to know whether she's being just ornery or, you know, they have a hard time with that, which I have a hard time with knowing whether she's just being nasty. So you just have to um, say, no, she's not. It, this is the sickness. Yeah, I always, err on, I always err on the side of saying, it's the disease talking. It's the disease. All right? Maybe she was always ordinary. But now it's the disease doing the talking. All right? If we place it squarely on that, yeah. it objectifies it. And it enables people to maybe have some emotional distance from some of the, the, the pain they feel when someone is talking back at them or, or, is, or is hitting them. I think the other thing that we, we've often seen is that particularly earlier on in the disease, there's a lot of fluctuation. So today or an hour ago, the person could do that, and now they can't do that. And so the challenge for caregivers is not to take that personally. Because that, unfortunately, is the reality of the disease. So, you know, they were able to use the toilet yesterday, and now it's all over the living room carpet. And, and, and they're just jerking my chain. No, the unfortunate reality is some days it's going to work and some days it's not. And it's just hard. It's, not, it's hard to predict. There may, as Dan said, there may be times they're jerking your chain, <laughs> but we don't know. I mean, it, 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 I think we just have to assume it's not because we know that the bulk of the time it's unfortunately the disease. The question is, is there a higher rate of Alzheimer's disease in, in people with other intellectual disabilities? The, the, la the last time I, I reviewed the literature on that very point, the answer is no. Okay, that's a, a relatively low rate of Alzheimer's disease uh, with, with other developmental disabilities. Okay, but unfortunately, then they're subject to heart disease and cancer that people with Down syndrome seem to uh, have a lower risk for. Yeah. I, I, I think there are, I think there are, um, so, so I would agree with that. I, I think that the answer is not that we know of, um, but I think there are some other intellectual disabilities that develop some challenge, intellectual challenges. For example, I have a patient in a nursing home that uh, had a shunt and, and, and has had multiple shunts and over the course of time that, that's unfortunately taken its toll. And so he, probably what he has is a dementia process related to uh, multiple shunts and malfunctioning shunts and infections and things like that rather than Alzheimer's disease, but it, it looks a lot like it, unfortunately. I have two people who are extremely resistant to entering a doctor's office. The comment is to two people that are uh, real resistant to entering the doctor's office. These are people with Alzheimer's disease? Yes. Yeah. And, and Down syndrome, yeah. So I, I, I think that uh, we see that not uncommonly. And so, you know, our approach is to, to go slowly. You know, uh, we occasionally would do what we call van visits, which we, we go out into the parking lot and see the person in the van. Obviously, the, we, don't, we don't do the full exam. And I can tell you that's a lot more pleasant in June than it is in January. Um, 
you know, so that's part, you know, so, so if, if you can get the person close, but, you know, we've talked to people in the waiting room, we've, you know, talked to people when, and not had them change clothes, and so I think you just do the best you can. Uh, and, and that's true for some folks with Down syndrome that don't have Alzheimer's disease. It's hard to get them into the office. So I, I just think you, you, you sort of do it step by step and, and, and make it happen as best you can and, and then work around it. I, I like to say that, and as I'm getting older, it's getting harder and harder. I like to say there's hardly a position that I've not taken to examine a patient with Down syndrome. On the floor, you know, in the chair, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do. But, um. Can I also uh, just add to that? I, I think, um, you know, ordinarily when we're going to a doctor's office, we, we have some mental preparation. People remind us. I think it, it serves no purpose to prepare somebody with Alzheimer's to say we're going to the doctor tomorrow or a week from tomorrow because they will become obsessed with this. It's like saying to you, we're going to the oncologist. It's like, why am I going to the oncologist? Do I have cancer? All right. So there's a lot of needless anxiety that we contribute to. So I, I believe in being in the moment and say we're, we're going for a ride. You know, we're, we're going to go to the Dairy Queen. Yes, yes. And maybe after you see Dr. Shacoin, you go to the Dairy Queen. <laughs> so there's a little bit of deception involved here, all right? But you've got to use that memory problem to your advantage sometimes and recognize <laughs> that they're going to be really worried and fearful with preparation. You know, we, we, it's, I just realized... Dairy Queen is not the, it's McDonald's that's the goal for so many of our patients. <laughs> we made a serious architectural error by not having golden arches out front. <laughs> so we got to go back and talk to the architects. <laughs> Portillo's is another favorite, yeah. One of the takeaways I'm going to have to say, I guess, I really got concerned when I saw the digression once. Tom's person was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it's a rapid deterioration. That just scares me. Yeah, the, yeah, the comment is about the rapid deterioration. And 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 it is it varies and, and in a very crude sort of way, I, I like to say that the person that has the farthest to fall falls the slowest. And the person that has the shortest to fall falls the fastest. And what I mean by that is is those individuals that tend to be closer to a normal intellect, it, in general, it tends to look lengthwise closer to the general population. So our folks that are, that are and now some of it may be that we just don't realize the diagnosis until much later in the folks that are more severely impaired. But in, as a general rule, uh, I would say there are folks that are, are the most uh, cognitively impaired before they develop Alzheimer's disease are the ones that, that deteriorate most rapidly. Um, you know, it, it, it's just an unfortunate reality that the situation that it is more rapid than this, at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So when it comes time for maybe home care, what are the resources that can go to for that? Like if we needed someone to come a few days a week or just my brother lives with my mom and... When, uh, but why, why, don't you, why don't you come up, Mary Lee, why don't you come up and hear an answer? This is Mary Lee and... No, I, you're right. I don't, is Grace? Grace, Grace might be one upstairs. This is Mar Mary Lee uh, was here at the beginning. She's our, one of our advocates. I'm going to have her. Uh... Um, actually, we, we um, been contacted by a group called. Um... Come to the camera. So, <laughs> so the, the question is about resources, uh, maybe home health resources as we go forward. Um, Senior Helpers is a group that specializes in care home care for people with dementia, and they were recently certified to also um, be able to provide care for people with Down syndrome or intellectual disabilities through, if anyone has home-based funding, how your home-based funding will now pay for senior helpers to come. Um, so there's information, I for sure is familiar, there's also a really nice um, video that they've put together on some of the care tips that Dan has mentioned or mentioned in here. Um, there are other home health agencies. This is the one that we have been approached with that seem to specialize in this. Uh, there's a cost, of course, for all of them. If you don't have home-based funding and you're paying for it privately, all home care involves a cost. I'm a senior living and I have a sister uh -huh. from Dr. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with senior health. And mm -hmm. and it's a fantastic job. That, is it Michael Turner? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He was just in today. A couple of years in the video is a woman named T. 
keep us snow who's amazing. The hospital had a lecture. If I could, for those who might not be able to hear that uh, upstairs, the comment was that uh, the Senior Helpers is really an outstanding uh, organization. Oh, is everybody else? Upstairs, downstairs. But thank you for bringing it up because that's where we met Michael Turner at the Tifa Snow um, lecture that Lutheran General had last year. She came and spoke to everyone. She's, just here, um, she's really incredible. She spoke at the Niles Senior Center. Yeah. Um, and she's, she's an amazing person. She really is. Yeah. And I, you guys are, it's amazing to hear what you're saying and to hear some of the questions back and forth too and the frustration that you might have with behavior or whatever, and the, your response of you got to go to where they are. It's the disease talking, and it, it, I mean, it's so enlightening. And of course, we have Rainbow Hospice with Dan, um, who has just been uh, just a friend and a partner with us here at the Down Syndrome Center, doing things cooperatively and collaboratively. Um, so if it gets to that stage where hospice is needed, then I recommend them more. And also, um, as you were suggesting activities, um, he goes to Shore with day program, and they've moved him into like a senior because you know they see yeah. that this going on now. So he's doing more arts and crafts, and more things that are he loves it. It's better for you. He enjoys it more. It seems to be better, yeah. a better fit for him. But on the weekend, um, just is there somewhere he could go? Or, or something, a group, or something, do, you, do they have support groups that we could go to to do anything? Do you know him? Or do we have respite that come in and take him out? Or? Respite would be an idea. Does he have home-based funding? Is, is that who pays for his day program at Shore? Some of the yeah. some of our folks who are older were kind of yeah. grandfathered into another system, right. so we're not familiar with what home-based funding is, but sometimes you can use some of that money for that. Um, I don't really know yeah. of any particular, that would be really nice yeah. if there was something like that. I know our older adult services has a daycare, an adult day program through Lutheran General, but that that would not be on the weekends, I don't believe. Yeah. So the, the comment was that some of the park districts have programs that the, that, that would be uh, available. What park district is that? Okay. So the comment was that Addison has some available. There's a lot of special oh, rec departments right. all across the state of right. Illinois, which is wonderful. But I think maybe more of them will be beginning programs as they see the one, need. Um, in Rolling Meadows. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. where I, I have in Rolling Meadows, but he lives in Skull. We have NWS. Right. But right. check with them. He might. But he's because, all the way out here. Um, yeah, but maybe they would know. That's so. so before we ended, I, I, we just have about 10 more minutes, I think. We talked about 8.30, right? Yeah. Okay, we have about 10 more minutes, but at some point before we ended, I wanted to offer, we, we also have a, a clinic of, uh, email, it's adultdownsyndromeclinic at gmail.com, and I'd like to encourage you to use it, and actually to answer this question, if you are aware of resources that you have found to be helpful, please send them to us, to us and we'll collate them, and, and we'll share them with others. So, we, we, I think part of the comment, I, as I was thinking about this, is maybe we together, can help either generate things or encourage other organizations to generate things that uh, that we know is becoming necessary. So for you, Shore, you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So Shore has has modified its day program for some individuals so that they can uh, they can uh, you know still participate. So those are the kinds of things. Uh, several agencies have have modified residences so that they can continue to take care of a person with Alzheimer's disease. We've seen, as some of our folks become very frightened by leaving the house, some of the agencies have developed day programs right in the person's home. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help the person continue to, to enjoy their activities, uh, even though they may not enjoy the same ones that they did previously. And so we want to continue to work on that. And so ideas you have and, 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 uh, and things that you see that are working, Please send them to us, and, and then we can uh, be a uh, resource for others as well to share them. So many questions. I, I 
Oh, yeah, I should clarify that. So the question is, you know, do you have to start taking people out of activities when they develop Alzheimer's disease? Our approach generally is to try to encourage them to stay doing what we, people with Down syndrome have what we call, most of them have what we call the groove, meaning they like to do things repetitiously the same, but they do things the same day in and day out. So for us to start to change that routine just because to change it, we think generally is not the right thing to do. So generally, we encourage people to stay with what they're doing and what they enjoy as long as they continue to enjoy it and as long as it continues to be good for them. And typically, we'll know that it's not good for them by seeing that they get agitated or unhappy or whatever in a setting that's too challenging for them. So we want to continue to stimulate them up to the point that, they, that they're capable of. Too much, and people tend to kind of get agitated or melt down. Too little, and we're not encouraging them to continue, hang on to their skills as long as possible. That's true for people with Down syndrome that don't have Alzheimer's disease as well. The challenge in folks with Alzheimer's disease is that the, the bar is lowering, but also any day from day to day, the bar is, is different. And so it's, it's a challenge to try to figure out where you are. So that it can be a problem. Another comment on that? Yeah, I, I just uh, thought about the, the bar lowering. Another analogy, I think uh, the best kind of caregivers are like improvisational actors. You've got to be light on your feet. You can't take yourself too seriously. You've got to be flexible and adapt day to day, moment to moment. Um, because I think people with Alzheimer's disease can flourish with somebody who is light and fun. All right? Somebody who's too serious, who's too authoritative, they will resist. All right? So um, modifying activities the way you described your, your son, going from one set of activities down to a, a, another, he is enjoying it, yes. all right? So, so we really have got to be flexible in our approach. So for folks who are, who are like not adapting, if they want to go and all that stuff, um, how do we advocate for those individuals when folks are like, yeah, let's maybe take it back a little bit and, and maybe they don't go to these things anymore so much? Yeah, I think there's a tendency sometimes to say, oh, now they've got Alzheimer's disease, so now we've got to take these drastic measures. No, no, no. I, I don't subscribe to that. I, I think routine and famous is, uh, is the lifeblood of people with Alzheimer's disease changing. Change requires memory and thinking skills, which they're losing, okay? So we've got to take things very, very slowly. Any, anytime we take something away, we've got to replace it with something else, all right? So I would challenge people who are saying, let's, let's shake things up here. No, no, no. Let's take a deep breath and figure out what is suited to this individual. Let's not lump everybody with Alzheimer's disease into a category and say they all behave a certain way. Everybody's a unique individual. Yeah, it, 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 it's, not a, it's not a highly scientific medical question, but I ask all day long of patients' families, does the person still enjoy it? And if the answer is yes, I, I don't typically see a reason to change. Yeah. The question is about aggressive behavior that's actually self-directed, and, and it's similar to, to, to uh, when it's directed elsewhere. Because we want to look for other possible causes, we want to look for environmental issues, we want to look for pain issues. Certainly, I think pain could be a, something we definitely want to look for. You know, there might be, as, as was mentioned, you know, there might there might be dental issues or sinus issues or, or whatever that the person is, is striking themselves for, uh, you know, in trying to eliminate pain. Uh, we want to look at, um, uh, you know, are they not sleeping? Is, is there something going on in the environment that's upsetting to them? Uh, or whatever the case may be. And then uh, and we look for all those things. And then if we can't find any other uh, answers, or even if we do and it persists, uh, then we want to potentially look at medication that might uh, calm them down. Yeah. Other questions? 
don't have a question. But I have or a comment. Um, in our particular circumstance, as my son has become less able to do things, he's still remaining in the group home, and I have advocated for more caregivers, and they responded and gave them to me. So if you are in this situation, go for the gold. All I can do is tell you no. But I, I, I have caregivers for him from 3 to 11 every day, Monday through Friday. I have... Saturday, Sunday people all the time, and I have a person that comes in at 6 o'clock in the morning. So the comment, and that's a good, because maybe think something else too, the comment was that uh, her, her son lives in, in a residential facility, and she was able to encourage them to get additional staff to help him as, as his skills decline. Now, some agencies are willing to do that, and some are not. Uh, it's not my place to, to judge them per se. So some agencies will take the philosophy that our job is for habilitation, and we're trying to teach people new skills and, and get them out in the community and things like that, and that's their mission. And, and so some, some of those agencies feel that uh, when a person declines that that's no longer part of their mission. That's one philosophy. The other, another philosophy is that we're going to keep the person there as long as possible, potentially even to, to the time they die. It's a different, it's different philosophically. Clearly, the, the, the second philosophy oftentimes does require, uh, require additional assistance. And so that's something that they would, if, if they're committing to that philosophy, they're oftentimes also committing to some additional assistance to provide that. And, and finance is what they are, particularly in Illinois. That's not always possible, unfortunately. I, I like your, uh, like your story because it's about advocacy. And all of you here, if you have a relative with, with Down syndrome, or any intellectual disability, you have learned to be advocates for your kids, for your relatives. And it doesn't end. All right? So I, I love that story because you, you asked for something and you got it. And I think it's, it's an encouraging word to everybody here. Well, I, I just want to thank everybody because, you know, this is a new, a new path for us. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like going back to the beginning. It's a brand new place, and I don't even know anything. And that was very frustrating to me, and that's why I approached the people and said, I, help me, just help me. I, I've got to have information. If I have information, then I can deal with this, and I can survive it and, and go along with it. And but without it, I'm just I'm drowning. And I think they know what I'm talking about. Good. Thanks for speaking up. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. And, um so please feel free to email us. We will, uh, we will uh, be looking to get the, as much of this up online as possible.